Hello and thank you for joining us for Witness TV. I'm your host, Rachel Bryson. Well, 2020 is officially here and it's a big year for the Diocese of Harrisburg, especially in the area of vocations. On today's show, we're going to introduce you to two seminarians from the diocese that are preparing to be ordained as transitional deacons. We'll then take a look at one of the main discernment events hosted by our vocations office each year. Al Ganoza from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference then joins us for your weekly update from the Capitol. Now, most of us know one or maybe even several priests, but have you ever wondered how one becomes a priest? Well, we sat down with two seminarians for the Diocese of Harrisburg to ask just that question. In the first part of our two-part story, we'll introduce you to Aaron Lynch and Peter Reddig, both of whom will share how they heard the call to the priesthood. Aaron, a member of St. Patrick's Parish in Carlisle, explained that in the beginning, he wasn't really into his faith, but that all changed when he started reading the Catechism of the Catholic Church. So growing up, uh, I didn't I always considered myself Catholic, always. Um, our family were always, if anybody ever asked, we're like, no, we're, we're definitely Catholic. Uh, but when I was growing up, if I didn't want to go to Mass, nobody made me. Um, there wasn't anybody like dragging me to church every Sunday. Um, which, we moved around a bit. My dad's a Marine, so we moved around a little bit. So it's hard to get connected to a parish. It's hard to like really enter into parish life uh, and get connected into a particular place. Um, but then when we moved to Pennsylvania, my family decided when we wanted to retire here, we wanted to stay here for a long time. And I think it was really my mom uh, who decided, you know what, we're Catholic, we're gonna start going to mass because that's what Catholics do, that's what we're supposed to do. Uh, so at the, uh, you know, the encouragement of my mother, we all started going to mass together and I, I didn't fall in love with it immediately. Um, I just, it was a nice thing to do now. But my, my mother decided, you're going to get confirmed. You're going to do confirmation because we've gotten all your sacraments. You're going to do confirmation. So I said, okay, we'll do confirmation. And my, God bless my confirmation teachers, my CCD teachers, who gave us homework, best homework ever. We were given paragraphs out of the catechism to read. And so every night after my CCD classes, I would you know, go home and sit at my desk and I'd read those paragraphs out of the catechism. I remember, I remember one night very specifically, I read the paragraphs I was supposed to, and I saw the heading for the next section. I thought, well, that looks interesting. Um, I've always wondered that. I'll read the next section, why not? So I read that, and the heading for the next section looked interesting too. So I thought, well, I've got time, I'll read that too. I just kept reading, and I kept reading paragraph after paragraph. And I remember very distinctly, I stopped, and I had the thought, they figured this thing out. Every question I had, there was an answer somewhere. I could look it up. Like I would just think of something, look at the index, look it up. There was, a, there was an answer there. And if I wasn't quite satisfied, there was a little footnote that would lead me to a book that someone wrote a thousand years ago that would explain exactly the answer to the thing I was searching for. And it just, the whole thing made so much sense to me. And I fell in love with the beauty of the trueness of the whole thing. And I fell in love with the, the truth of the Catholic faith. But I hadn't yet fallen in love with the church. I thought this is like a really interesting system. I think it, I think it might be true and it's really cool. If anything is true, this is definitely true. Um, but I remember really it wasn't until high school. So after I had gotten confirmed, it wasn't until about my sophomore year of high school that uh, I, I got really into learning as much as I could about the faith. And I remember sitting at lunch one day and I was talking to my friend across the table from me who wasn't interested at all. I was very annoying telling everybody about everything I had been learning, reading every book I could find. And uh, my friend next to me, he turned to me and said, Aaron, not the most important thing in the world. Shut up. And I think that was the first time anyone had confronted me with the thought, like, what's the most important thing in the world? What's the most important thing in the world? And I came to the conclusion in that moment, there's nothing more important than this. There's nothing more important than Jesus Christ and his church. Nothing more. That, like, I can't think of anything more important than that. And so by the end of high school, I had decided you know, this is something incredibly important and something that I can see like real men doing and something that's really attractive to me. So I just, I just want to try this. So I met with, at the time, Father Lavoie, who was the vocations director, about 
you know, partway through my, my second year, things got really rough and I thought about leaving maybe, but I said, I'll stick around until the end of my second year. By the end of my second year, I decided, you know what? No, this is definitely worth it. Uh, and that was years and years ago now. I'm uh, in the middle of my seventh year of seminary now, and I'm happier now than I've ever been. Uh, and those, you know, that, that push um, from just falling in love with the truth of the faith and then finding people who are also interested in that and also love Christ and his church and who want to spend time talking about it, uh, talking to each other and being with each other and praying together and going to Mass together and just being together was, you know, a huge push for me uh, to enter the seminary. And it's made me incredibly happy. There are difficult times. It's hard, but I'm incredibly happy doing it. Now, Peter attended Catholic school, was dating, and was thinking marriage might be in his future. But God had a different path in mind for Peter, as he tells us. Well, I always like to say, I first heard the voice of Christ calling me towards the priesthood in my first real experience in adoration. And I went to a Catholic school in Hagerstown, Maryland. I still lived in Dice of Harrisburg, but Hagerstown's right over the border. I went there for four years, and I remember my religion teacher saying, do you know you can have, you actually can have a relationship with Jesus Christ through the Eucharist, because that is Jesus Christ. And so, I kind of took that seriously, as seriously as a teenager could take it, who's kind of questioning everything. So I decided, what the heck, why not? Why not go down to the Adoration Chapel right next to the school that was attached to the campus and pray and see what Jesus says? So I did it. You know, nothing happened at first, but I was persistent. And I remember, after about four or five days of doing it, this notion, this, complete, this completely exterior idea of the priesthood kept popping into my head, and I know I wasn't producing it myself. And every time it happened, I felt tranquil. So I said, this is weird. I have a girlfriend. I don't want to have anything to do with this, you know, when I get married or whatever. And so I brushed it off. But I kept going back to the Adoration Chapel and saying, Lord, I'm here. I want to get to know you. So not only did I get to know him, but he also kept saying, I'm not going to let you get to know me, not only going to let you get to know me, but I'm also going to call you to something special. So I felt that call. What did I do? I kept ignoring it. I kept running. Having gone to Quo Vadis Days the summer before, I was praying a lot about my vocation and I was making, I was trying to make a decision because it was my senior year. I could go become a freshman at some college, you know, go straight into the workforce or I could go into seminary, like Father Lavoie was telling me, our vocation director at the time. And I decided, you know what, why not try Novena? I've heard people talking about Novenas, you know, and who should I pray to? St. John Vianney, the patron saint of diocesan priests. Who better to pray to? Who better to ask to pray for you than him? So I decided to pray, and it was weird because three days into that Novena, I was talking to my girlfriend on the phone, and she said, Peter had a really weird dream and I woke up at four in the morning and I knew you were supposed to be a priest or something. I just, I, I saw that image in a dream. I was like, okay, well, that's weird. I was like, God, come on, God. So, so I, I just kind of like brushed it off and after I hung up, I said a prayer. I said, God, if this is you, please I'd let it happen again. Again, I was stubborn. And it did. And the next day I was talking to her and she called back. She said, Peter had the exact same dream. I woke up the exact same time. I'm like, okay, we need to talk. <laughs> I knew he was calling me to the priesthood, but on his time. After that, I decided it's time to go. So I, I decided to enter the seminary. And that was 2014. And I've been in seminary ever since. And I entered second college at St. Charles where Aaron's at. I did college at St. Charles, graduated, did one year at the University of Navarra in Spain, and now I'm doing my second year at Mount St. Mary's currently, going into diaconate ordination with Aaron in May. We kind of both agree that it, it qu hasn't quite hit yet, um, in the sense that um, we've been talking about the diaconate for so long, and, and we kept saying, oh, well, you know, it's so far away. And then people start mentioning it, 
and the reality hits when people start buying their stoles. Our classmates start buying their stoles from different dioceses who are in our class, and and we're like, oh man, it's really hitting, you know. So we're preparing and um, we're looking forward to it, praying a lot. So yeah, it's. Uh, I started when I was 18. I'm 25 now. So um, you're told at the beginning, like just discern the now, like look at the now, focus on the now, and we'll worry about that stuff later when we get to it. We're there now. Um, so I haven't quite been able to like shift my uh, my thinking toward uh, diaconate, but it's becoming very real now. I mean, we just had our meeting with uh, the vocation instructor, starting to plan out the actual liturgy itself, like picking readings and who's going to do what, and uh, looking at music and things like that. So it's becoming very real, um, and it really takes a a big part of your prayer now that uh, we're so close. Well, Aaron and Peter will be ordained as transitional deacons in May and will serve in that position for one year. They will each work at a parish within the diocese during the summer, assisting the pastor and gaining an even greater understanding of the role of a priest. Next week, Aaron and Peter will be back to talk about life at the seminary. Well, keeping our focus on vocations, every year the diocese hosts Quo Vadis Days, an annual retreat for men to explore a possible vocation. During this summer retreat, young men between the ages of 15 and 25 gather at Mount St. Mary Seminary in Emmitsburg, Maryland. Now these men engage in prayer, discernment talks, daily mass, a nighttime rosary, sporting and water games, and camaraderie with priests and seminarians from throughout the diocese. All of these events are designed to bring these young men together as they consider the vocation they might be called to. Why are you here? What is discernment? Well, you're here to get the application at the end of the week. No, okay. <laughs> When you get such a, a good group of guys all around one another with you know similar ideals and uh, what they're looking for in their life, you really get this good fraternity, you know, a, a strong sense of bonding between everyone. And uh, in that, we can all grow with each other and get closer to God. And it's it's really good. It's nice. I started to think about the priesthood um, a few years ago when I came into the church. And I was looking for um, a different avenues to explore God's will for my life. So I have a, a few friends that I went to school with, and they recommended I come to Quo Vadis, And uh, that's how I heard about it, and I, I came here. We've been having Quo Vadis days at Mount St. Mary's Seminary, which is my alma mater, uh, for the entire time that we've had Quo Vadis days. And it really gives them a sense of the routine. You wake up, you do breakfast, you have morning prayer, you have mass together. There's times for one-on-one -on -one speaking with a priest or confession, spiritual direction, just talking questions but then lots of recreation. Uh, we know it's important for young men to be able to just be, just to be with each other. There's not you know, trophies involved, there are tests, exams involved, and so there's a chance for them to unwind. So a true spiritual retreat, retreating from the worldliness of, of the everyday life, but then that we could then advance in fr friendship with Jesus Christ. I had a couple years in college and uh, I had to do some major searching. So my uh, priest, um, Father Richard Lyons, had um, suggested that I come along to maybe get a little more of a sense of where might, where God might take me. I've had a new um, found respect for how much prayer that we get here. Um, we do a daily rosary every single night. We do a uh, liturgy of the hours every single day. Um, we get a holy hour mass every single day, which is really, really great. And that's just, I have i haven't respected that as much as this year um, by the fact that since I've grown a lot more in prayer over the last year, getting to have so much time of prayer um, this year at Covatus, um, more than I actually thought I could have. Um, Prayer is the way that God really talks to us and really shows us what He wants to do with us. And so just being able to dive into that more and more and more um, these last few days has really been really, really refreshing for me. Coming to Covatus every year has really helped me bring uh, my Catholicism with me. Uh, I feel like a lot of people as they enter their young adult life start to lose that religion because of what society has with us right now. And coming to Covatus every summer really gets me back in touch and, and helps me bring the religion along with me. And um, helps me understand how I can live it in my everyday life going forward. We're, we're all guys here, you know. I've for longest time seen um, priests as kind of that 
father figure, and they are, but more of a untouchable figure that holier than now. Um, and it's good to see with this interaction that they're just human like the rest of us. They're just human men like the rest of us. They're awesome. Like, I mean, sometimes people may say, oh, well, they're priests, but they're just humans like the rest of us. You know, we've, being at Quabatis, we can, you know, we breakfast, lunch, and dinner with them. We play rec time with them. So it's just an awesome time to be able to enjoy with them. And, you know, you see them outside of church, so you're able to see them in, like, playing basketball and kickball. And it's cool to see, like, a lot of them are athletic. And, you know, it, it's fun to play different games and um, see their different, their different skills in other areas of life. It's just like hanging out with the bros. Like they're just really, they're just really, really cool guys that um, just happen to love Jesus just as much as I do. Priests playing dodgeball, uh, glow in the dark frisbee, basketball, billiards, risk, poker, golf, golf the card game, not on the course because we're not that highfalutin here in the Diocese of Harrisburg. Uh, but these guys, and then in the middle of those games these young men will ask the priests, hey, we have this question. And then priests are able to give testimony. You know, on Sundays, we're typically explaining the scriptures or the sacraments or any other types of spiritual things. Oftentimes, you don't get a chance to ask the priest, hey, where did you grow up? Hey, who are the priests who influenced you? Hey, and you know, they say, yeah, that hey, because I mean, the, the formality of yesteryear is largely gone. Hey, when did you first start thinking about this? And then when you say to them, when I was your age, that gets them thinking. Give it a try. I mean, it, there's no harm in coming. It's just a great week um, to have fun with other guys and to get closer to God. And really, you know, nothing is forced upon you. There's no application at the end of the week. There's nothing like that. It's just so you can see a little bit of the other side of the picture, you know. Uh, we grow up in a family because, you know, you have parents. And so you see that vocation every day but to see the priestly vocation outside of a church is, is really amazing, and I think it's eye-opening. I think a lot of people should experience it. Well, in addition to Quo Vadis Days, the diocese also hosts Fiat Days, which is our annual retreat for young women to explore a possible vocation. Up next, Al Ganoza joins us with an update from the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. Al? All right, let's uh, check back in at the Capitol. Al Ganoza here with the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference. You can divide lawmakers into many different classifications, but one big dichotomy, how do you like that word? That means splitting them into two, uh, is between the savers and the uh, spenders. One big group of savers is here in central Pennsylvania. And just recently, they introduced a, a group of bills that they hope will change the way Pennsylvania spends and borrows. And here is that group. The representatives in no particular order are Carrie Benninghoff, Tim O'Neill, Seth Grove, there's Don Kiefer right there, Andrew Lewis, Chris Dush, Torin Ecker, Clint Owlett, and Barbara Glime. First up, we hear from Representative Grove, who talks about how certain folks skirted spending curbs in the past and about the use of those special funds and how this legislation would address that. Under Ed Rendell, this is before my time, but all the rainy day funds were spent and the statute required a two-thirds vote. So when they drafted the bill, they had line one was repeal the two-thirds requirement. Line two, they spent the money in the same law. And their argument was, well, why, like, you have to take it in order. So we repealed the two-thirds requirement, so we don't need that anymore. And then we spent the money. So it's cool. Um, you can't do that with a constitutional amendment. You can't just, because it takes two consecutive sessions, right? So that's why we want to lock some of this down constitutionally, and then some some areas provide some statutory um, uh, language. So it is only Representative O'Neill, so that would be the constitutional amendment. Uh, Dawn's is also a constitutional amendment. That one is, you know, no more special funds outside of some unique circumstances like motor licensing fund, um, pensions, um, so if, if, if we have, if, if we're um, coal mine reclamation, so we're taking from an industry to clean up that industry. So that would be allowed because that's kind of a self-serving, right. but environmental stewardship fund it used to be a grant program, moved it offline, it doesn't need to be there. Just make it harder for them, them, those people. <laughs> 
<laughs> make eyes. Why don't you say eyes? Us, <laughs> us um, have better fiscal discipline at budget time to not do the whole, oh, we only spent, it's only a 1.8% increase this year when really it's 5, 6, 90%. I talked with Representative Dawn Kiefer several months ago, and she was very concerned even back then about all these special uh, groups and funds where money is tucked away for different groups around the state. Well, she has authored a bill to try to change that. And, uh, Seth has a couple that will take some special funds and move them back into the general fund. Mine would just stop the practice going forward, which would be a huge step. I feel like every week I'm in session, we have somebody that has a bill, and you have to really pay attention. It's buried in there as we create this special fund, it ships it offline. And that's really, like, I really feel like it's a special interest push. And that way they don't have to come in front of the General Assembly every year and ask for the reappropriation or increase. Before, when we were going through all those special funds, the money we were looking to take was not one penny of operational dollars. It was end fund balance, what's left year after year that accumulates. And they get interest as well. So if that was sitting in the general fund, a, we wouldn't have the cash flow issues because the money would be sitting there. And B, we would be getting the interest. Those funds and special funds, they never lapse. They always occur, unlike the general funds. Who uses it then? Agencies? Agencies. So it's in the statute according to how it was written. So uh, so the multimodal transportation fund, that would go to PennDOT. Um, there's a, a environment fund, and that would go to DEP. There's that, I think they call it parks. It's called something T. It's a parks and rec fund, essentially, that would go to DCNR. And at that time that we were looking at it, that was $110 million surplus. We have a that they were sitting on and fund balance usually in that plan, but nobody could touch any of it. Now, is that money the this legislators happens. should have a say in how it's spent? So absolutely. Okay. absolutely. And just because we're some we're legislator 40 years ago thought we should have always put this money dedicated, money doesn't mean we have to do that today. I mean, legislators change, so constituents' priorities change, and so they essentially have lost their voice in that money. Let's talk about Senate Bill 906. That is by Senator John Udichak, and it's a bill that calls for a moratorium on the closure of two state centers for the uh, intellectually challenged. That would be Polk, P-O-L-K, and Whitehaven. Whitehaven. Uh, we share the same concerns that many lawmakers and advocates have about the closing of those centers without adequate measures being taken to help the residents that now live in those centers. And one of the big lawmakers that has worked hard on this issue is Representative Tara Tuhill. I talked with her about the issue. Senate Bill 906 with Senator Udichak moved out of the Senate and then today moved out of the House Health Committee, um, thanks to Chairwoman Rapp. And this is something that's very important to my area and also Polk Center, Whitehaven Center in my area. Um, we have been trying to keep this facility open for the intellectually disabled because I believe that you're supposed to be able to have choice as a family if you're going to be on a residential campus or if you're going to be in smaller community housing. Uh, so that's a choice that we want to be able to maintain. So this bill puts a moratorium on Department of Human Services decision to have closure of Whitehaven Center and of the Polk Center. And it seems like you have bipartisan support, right? So you would think this would have a bright future, don't you? Yes, so we actually, um, it, it is controversial. The governor would like the closure and Department of Human Services, and they're actually in the facilities now um, trying to relocate individuals. Uh, but one of our concerns that we have is the mortality rate um, and the death rate, that there is a higher death rate when you move individuals out of their lifelong home. Um, and that's something that we wanted to protect these elderly, intellectually disabled individuals from. One of our many good friends in the PA House is Representative Aaron Bernstein from out in southwestern Pennsylvania, and he has proposed a bill that would make it a little tougher on inmates who cause trouble after they are incarcerated. He just saw that bill pass the House. It would postpone consideration of a violent inmate's parole until an additional 24 months following the inmate's minimum release date for each conviction for a violent offense while incarcerated. It has other measures too. Once again, it passed the House. I talked to Representative Bernstein about Markey's Law.
Marky Mason was brutally murdered by someone who should have never been released from prison because they had violent offenses while they were in prison. They were released prematurely, and our bill actually goes in and it ensures that we're able to fix that issue and keep hardened criminals, violent criminals, behind bars right where they belong. What's the support like? You got some good support on both sides? We have significant support and co-sponsors from both Republicans and Democrats. This isn't about Republicans or Democrats. This is about keeping our streets safe. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, welcome back. By the way, I came inside a little cold out there, getting a little dark, too. All right, a couple of loose ends to tie up. Coming up in January, later in January, will be uh, when the Senate returns and takes up the House amended version of telemedicine. This is a huge vote uh, for pro lifers. The House version has our amendment ensuring that telemedicine cannot be used for abortions. We're working with a coalition of pro life groups to ensure the Senate does not revert to prior printer numbers to strip out our amendment. Now, if if they vote to concur in the, in the Senate, so the House version will go to the governor who has promised to veto because of the abortion language. However, we would rather have veto than a law allowing uh, teleabortions. All right, criminal justice reform, great news here. House Bill 1477 by Representative Cheryl Delosier of Cumberland County has passed the House. This is a bill that allows uh, inmates who have served their time the possibility of getting an occupational license. They have been prevented in the past by uh, the law uh, the, uh, and just, just entanglements, red tape. Well, the amended version of the bill tightens restrictions, introduces reporting requirements for those seeking such a license, license and ensures that individuals are not endangered by those who not, should not be professionally licensed. We expect final passage by the Senate uh, sometime in 2020. And one more thing, I talked to you last time about that service, uh, MATP, that takes people to their doctor's appointment. There's a, uh, a move by the feds to change it over to uh, a brokered service, take away from the counties. Well, we are happy to announce the uh, Wolf administration has uh, capitulated to a lot of demands by lawmakers and advocates and announced an 18-month delay in plans to move it to that brokerage model. All right, that's it. I'm Al Canoza with the PCC. Uh, let's go over to Rachel. Well, thanks, Al. That does it for us, and we hope you enjoyed this week's show. To learn more about the Diocese of Harrisburg and our ministries, please visit hbgdiocese.org. More information on the Pennsylvania Catholic Conference and the important work they are doing can be found at pacatholic.org. From all of us at the Diocese and the Catholic Conference, thank you for watching and Happy New Year.